Good morning and welcome to another edition of Viewpoint on More Public Radio. I'm your host, Edric Osborne, and you can catch Viewpoint every Saturday morning, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. on morepublicradiointernational.org. You can also catch us via podcast at edric.net. We are now on Twitter, which is at Viewpoint Radio, and uh, you can also follow us on SoundCloud. Just search Viewpoint Radio or go to edric.net, look for the link, and you can get all of our interviews uh, that we bring you each and every week. My first guest this morning is David Misch. He is the author of the brand new book, Funny the Book, Everything You Always Want to Know About Comedy. David is an established comedy writer. He's written for Mork and Mindy, Saturday Night Live, uh, a host of other comedic endeavors, and uh, he's here now to tell us about his brand new book about comedy and being funny. David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Um, first question is, uh, let me start with a little biographical information. How did you first realize you were funny, <laughs> and uh, when did you know that comedy and comedy writing was something that was going to be a part of your life? I don't think, <laughs> I'm not sure I ever knew I was funny. I just knew I was really interested in things that were funny. I mean, I grew up with the, the writers James Thurber and Robert Benchley. I saw the Marx Brothers on TV, and all those things just were incredibly enticing to me. Um, I guess, you know, like anyone, you know you're funny when people laugh at what you say, and it was intentional to get a laugh. <laughs> but, of sure. course, that can be a little, um, uh, it, it can fool people, because, you know, you hear a lot of people who say, I could be a comedian, I could be a comedy writer. People are laughing what I say all the time. But what you have to remember is they're your friends. <laughs> <laughs> so it's only when people you don't, who don't have a vested interest in you laugh at what you say intentionally. Then, uh, then you can start thinking about it. <laughs> uh, you know, one thing about about being funny, and and for me, uh, just you know, the funniest guy I know is my dad. Uh-huh. My my dad is hilarious. Um, you know, he's not a comedian, but at when we have get-togethers and and his family, it's just it's raucous, it's loud, it's we laugh. And so, was was that something like that that you grew up in, where, where there were people in your family who who maybe have influenced you and and maybe kind of shaped the way your comedy view is? Oh, absolutely. And I think all comedy people. Um, you know, uh, it, many of them have been inspired by things like that. But again, and it's actually an interesting thing, uh, the difference between social comedy and professional comedy. Uh, it's like any other job. You go in and <clears throat> you're selling insurance, and you think, I don't really feel like selling insurance today. You have no choice. You still must sell insurance. And in the same way, comedy writers don't have the option of waiting for a party or a congenial atmosphere or someone you're trying to impress. You just have to crank it out. And in doing that, you begin to learn some professional skills, which in a way it sort of cheapens it. It's like, you know, I can just manufacture comedy. And I can. I know how to manufacture comedy. I know how to do things that will make people laugh. But in a way, that takes some of the spontaneity out of it. And finding that balance of the joy that we get just from kidding around with our friends and actually doing it for a living is a, is a tricky thing to, to find the balance of. Um, uh, let, let me now get focused on the book, and, and one of the things I really enjoyed about your book is that um, you you cover a lot of ground in in ways that's easily digested, if I can say it that way. Um, and you go from the earliest jokes to what's happening now. You talk about ethnic comedy. I mean, you have a variety of topics, and it really makes you think just how broad and widespread comedy is. So tell us about the origins of the book and, and, and why you wanted to, uh, to, to write it. I've always been fascinated by comedy, but also I'm fascinated by the mechanics of things. I'm a sucker for those behind-the-scenes things of movies, so you, you're there on the set and you see how this shot was gotten and how that special effect was achieved. A lot of people feel that ruins it for them, and it, I guess it does, but for me it only enhances it. I think that's so cool they did that and they got that effect. So I love dissecting things. I love pulling things apart, and the old of saying with comedy is that if you examine it, it dies. Mm. You can't mm. examine a joke and still have it be funny. But I think that's sort of a, a simplistic way of looking at it because, of course, that's true, but the only way you can examine a joke is once you've heard it. And once you've heard it, you've laughed. Mm. So then you go back and examine it. You're not trying to get people to laugh again. You're trying to get them to figure out how they got that laugh. Sure. So anyway, I just love uh, looking into the origins of comedy and how it's uh, appeared pretty consistently through, uh, you know, thousands of years of human culture, 
and uh, and how you know the earliest you know the earliest recorded joke is a fart joke, <laughs> and they're still working today. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, you, you imagine how many whoopee cushions have been sold uh, over the past <laughs> seventy true. years or whatever. Uh, let me get a quick reset. This is Viewpoint on More Public Radio. I'm your host, Jedrick Osborne, and our guest this morning is David Mitch. He is the author of the brand new book, Funny the Book: Everything You Always Wanted to Know About comedy. Um, one of the things are, and one of the aspects of comedy you talk about uh, are the famous tricksters and, and they cross cultural lines, generational lines. Um, maybe talk to us a little bit about tricksters and the role that they've played in, in, in comedy over the years. Well, trickster is a mythological figure and it's a name that's actually manufactured. It was <coughs> thought up by historians and anthropologists. There's no culture that says we have a trickster. They all have different names and they are, there are hundreds of names. In, the, in cultures uh, extending back thousands of years. But what they are is essentially the contemporary comedian, which is it is someone who disrupts, someone who throws things into chaos, someone who frequently loves chaos for chaos's sake. One of the great things uh, about Trickster, and you can see it even in the films of the early films of the Marx Brothers, is that tricksters do things to cause chaos and, and so disruption even when it's against their own interests, <laughs> even if it results in their being, you know, hurt in some way, they just can't resist it. So uh, the idea of trickster is uh, the, the man dresses as a woman, the bum becomes rich, the, uh, chi- the adult acts like a child. Anytime the normal social order is thrown apart, is inverted, is changed dramatically, that's trickster at work. And they do it, and to me this is a great thing about trickster, their only motivation is to cause trouble. Mm. They just love causing trouble. But you can even sort of, you know, figure out a reason for that, which is that causing trouble makes people think. It makes people figure out if this is not the normal way of things, why isn't it the normal way of things? Should it be the normal way of things? So even though it's sort of a just I'm going to go in there and cause trouble, if you think hard about it, there's actually a lot more going on. Um, you mentioned the Marx Brothers, and and they're one of my, some of my all-time favorite movies are are the Marx Brothers movies. Um, just zany and and uh, surreal, and just you name it. It's it's really hard to just to describe just the impact that they've continue to have on on yeah. comedians today. Um, you know, for me, one of the funniest scenes is is in I believe it's in Duck Soup. Um, it's one of the ones where Harpo is in is having a, a fight with a peanut vendor. Oh <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and you know it ends up with him, you know basically washing his feet in the guy's lemonade. I mean, it's, it's yeah. just that kind of stuff to this day just puts me on the floor. So talk to us a little bit about the Marx Brothers and just, you know, why they are so unique, because there's never been anybody like them before or since. Yeah, and it's true. And in fact, there, is, there have been attempts, too. But it's very hard to replicate, especially since the three of them are so different. And in fact, in the book, I make a, 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 an, inter- a, an observation that you could actually look at the Marx Brothers as different aspects of trickster. Mm, One mm-hmm. of the uh, key aspects of trickster is uh, language. They play with language. They love puns. They love plays on words. And again, they do it to confuse and bewilder people. And Groucho was, of course, the king of language. It was a torrent of words, frequently insults, that, uh, that tore the place apart as much as if he'd been wrecking it with his bare hands. That's what he did with language. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there's Harpo, who hated language, who was, you know, mute in the movies and uh, did anything he could to screw up human communication. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and the trickster aspect of Harpo is that he was sort of magical. He had an overcoat which he could open and pull out any object. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he sometimes pretended he was a woman, so there's a sort of gender switching is another part of trickster. And then um, uh, Chico, who uh, uh, is sometimes pronounced Chico, but it turns out it's Chico because he liked chasing chicks. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, he was another language guy, extremely uh, facile with puns, uh, the most, one of the most famous ones being where uh, he's signing a contract uh, that Groucho is offering him, and Groucho, and he, he's suspicious of it, uh, of one particular part, and Groucho says, no, that's fine, it's just a standard sanity clause. Everyone, <laughs> all contracts have that. And Chico says, you can't fool me. There ain't no Santa Claus. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and to that point, because um, you talk about ethnic humor as well, um, you would think that Chico was Italian. I mean, he, he had this yeah. Italian affectation. But the reality is that they, they really played off, you know, ethnic humor in that respect. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit, maybe segueing into just the importance of, of ethnic humor and how jokes tended to come out of, you know, sometimes the pain of assimilation. 
Absolutely. Well, vaudeville around the turn of the century, uh, which was a form of variety theater, they had acts, uh, comedy acts, dog acts, balancing acts. But the uh, uh, it was frequently for the lower classes, middle classes, uh, people who didn't have a lot of money. It was cheap, and it had cheap thrills and cheap laughs in it. And they would frequently make fun of each other. They'd make fun of the other ethnic groups which were struggling to make it in America, Jews, blacks, Irish. And um, the Marx Brothers grew up in that time, and their initial act was a um, uh, making fun of other ethnicities. Groucho played a broad, silly German, and Chico played Italian. Harpo was mute even then. But these are things that nowadays we would find unbelievably offensive. I think back then they found them lovably offensive. Mm. It was like, of course that's stupid and horrible, but it's funny and no one takes it seriously, except, of course, when you're outside the vaudeville theater. Exactly. And then you, it, it's taken very seriously indeed, but it, I think you could say it was a way of sort of, in the same way that uh, Lenny Bruce and uh, Richard Pryor tried to deprive the N-word of its power by using it, in the same way, I think these people were, frequently they would make fun of their own ethnic group, and they're doing it to sort of take the poison out of it by showing how silly and stupid the whole thing was. Now, obviously it didn't work entirely. There, right. there was racism then, and I believe there's still some now. But, um, but you can see how the impulse from the, uh, from the groups came. And you bring up Richard Pryor, who, you know, obviously, you know, the penultimate stand-up comedian, the guy who who a lot of folks, you know, aspire to and say that's the, that's the one who really has set the bar that probably no one will ever achieve. And he just, you know, he came along at the right time. He had the right mix of um, funny, but he also made you think as well in terms of his, his view on racism and, and people, not just racism. And, and even in some of the movies he made, you know, like Which Way Is Up to me is still one of the funniest movies around. If you ever want to f- watch a movie and just laugh from beginning to end, Watch which way is up, and you know, but it tackled unionism and 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 agriculture and stuff. So, maybe talk to us now about Richard Pryor and 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 that type of humor, especially as it developed in the late sixties, early seventies, and and shows like, you know, All in a Family and Sanford and Son, which which was grounded in that kind of humor. Yeah, well, Pryor is uh, you know one of my idols. The uh, I, I make it clear that in this relatively short book, I cannot list the. I'm not trying to deal with just the objectively greatest people in right. each one of these comedy areas. But I deal with the people I think are the most special. And the three stand-ups I choose are Woody Allen, Steve Martin, and Richard Pryor. Now, Pryor uh, gave, I just want to put a shout-out here to a movie called Richard Pryor Live in Concert, made in 1979, or came out in 79, made in 78, which a lot of people, including me, feel is the greatest stand-up performance ever recorded. So run out and get it. It's just incredible. And the highlight of it, and what some people feel is maybe the greatest comedy bit, three minutes ever, is where Richard Pryor uh, plays his own heart yes. as he's having a heart attack. <laughs> it's, it's so mind-boggling. It's so cosmic. It's you so should have been eating all that pork, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The pork line is really right. one of the great lines in it. But anyway, this, this thing is so above what anyone else had ever conceived of for stand-up comedy. It takes it to a level... That has really never been achieved, and I gotta say, a lot of the people who have uh, imitated Richard, or not imitated, but followed in Richard Pryor's footsteps, often quite avowedly, they they say it, you know, this is what I'm doing. I feel they tend to miss it. They take the obscenity and they right. throw out obscenity. But right. Pryor was never just about obscenity. He used it for a reason. Anyway, um, he was unbelievable, and trying to get to the core of what he was, there was a comic named D.L. Hughley who had a great line. He said, "Most people spend their lives." trying to hide what they're afraid of. Richard spent his life showing what yeah. he was afraid of. And his ability to show his fears, which ultimately were our, all, all our fears, that's what made him, I think, above and beyond what had ever been done. Uh, we have a few minutes left. This is Viewpoint on More Public Radio, and our guest is David Mitch. He is the, brand, the author of the brand-new book, Funny the Book, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About comedy um let me ask you now i mean we can go on and i mean there's just so much to to cover with comedy and and i'm a huge fan of comedy it's just i could talk to you forever but i want to zone in on a couple of uh key aspects now television writing which is you you wrote from work in mindy the muppets take my hand and a very to me underrated series which was police squad lieutenant frank drebin and that whole zucker and and airplane and that kind of just we talked about the marx brothers being zany they, that was something totally different as well when it came out, when Airplane, it kind of changed the game. So 
writing like that, writing for television, your experience, you know, what was that like? And, 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 and writing for someone like Robin Williams. Oh, yeah, well, they're, they're all very different. Um, Robin was great, you know, he, that was the show that made him a star. And it was really one of the great exciting moments of my life, the first episode of Mork and Mindy. And we'd been in rehearsal with Robin, and we knew it. We knew this was going to be a giant star. And it was so exciting is every night I'd go home and i think, I know something no one else knows. <laughs> I know they're going to be in love with this guy who they've never met. But then the first moment when he came on the stage, the first moment the crowd went nuts. He could barely open his mouth. It was so obvious. He radiated brilliance. He radiated something you'd never seen before. And uh, to, to be there and feel the electricity among this small crowd of 300 people and know that tens of millions of people were soon going to feel it, too, was, that was very extraordinary. <laughs> and then writing for the Muppets was quite exciting with Frank Oz and uh, Jim Henson. And then, um, uh, what was the other? Oh, Police Squad. Police Squad. It was relatively obscure. But what was cool there is that uh, Jim Abrams, was Jerry Zucker, and his brother David Zucker, who had done Airplane, were on that show. And it was the first time I'd been working with people who were really professional uh, smart, young comic people, and where you could have an actual discussion about why that word was misplaced in that mm. sentence. Who took it seriously? Mm. And, you know, the thing about Airplane and Police Squad and, and the movies like that is um, they, they had a little bit of everything. There was slapstick, there were sight mm -hmm. gags, uh, very intelligent uh, writing, uh, wordplay, you name it. I remember I was uh, probably about 12 or 13 when Airplane came out. And, you know, watching it with my buddies, we, that's back when you could actually watch a movie over and over and over. And I, thought, I think we sat there in the theater and watched it about three times. <laughs> um, it was just so far out there. But, it was, but for a, you know, a 12, 13-year-old boy, it was perfect. It was the perfect movie. It had a little yeah. bit of everything. And even today, it still holds up as one of the greatest, I think, one of the greatest uh, comedic films of all time. So, you, you, know, you know, the opening shot is uh, you're up in the clouds <laughs> and you see the fin of an airplane stick up through the cloud. Right. And then they play the Jaws. Exactly. And exactly. the crowd just goes nuts, and, and, and invariably, because it's just such a great association. And from that moment on, you're just in their pocket, whatever they want to do with you. It's just an <laughs> uh, amazing film. Well, well, uh, David, again, I know we could talk uh, ongoing forever. I mean, I didn't even get to mention Jerry Lewis. I mean, again, uh, comedic. Maybe take a couple minutes and just your thoughts on Jerry Lewis. I guess, just got to tell you one thing. Sure. So I, I, uh, the book has links. Uh, to videos on the net, and um, I sort of collect these things to, uh, for, I teach sometimes too, and I remembered a Jerry Lewis gag that reminded me of a Buster Keaton gag, and I wanted to get it, and I couldn't remember what it was from. I'm talking to a friend of mine, and he said, why don't you talk to Jerry Lewis? And I said, <laughs> I beg your pardon. He said, Listen, I know this guy, he's a producer, and he's working with Jerry Lewis on a movie right now. I'll mention to the producer, we'll see if he'll talk, tell Jerry, and who knows, maybe he'll be able to find out. So, uh, like, two or three days later, I get a call. It's from Jerry Lewis. Wow. <laughs> wow. He's on his boat, he says. And uh, I say, here's the bit I'm interested in. He said, oh, yeah, that's reel two of Nutty Professor. Uh, about ten minutes, about uh, eight minutes in reel two. Uh, and that's exactly where it was. <laughs> wow. So that was pretty exciting. I mean, you know, his body of work. I mean, I know we're, we're a little old, but that's okay. We're public radio. Um, <laughs> his his body of work and, and uh, even, you know, the, the early movies with Dean Martin were, were one phase. But I think he's underrated in terms of his impact on film because, if, if I'm not mistaken, he was one of the first folks to actually watch video of the production as it was ongoing and playbacks that way. Yeah. And some he of the... Invented, he invented that technique. Exactly. And some of the sophisticated shots... The sight gags, especially the movies, you know, the Technicolor. It was they were just, you know, the, the the technical aspects of his work, in addition to the the significant level of comedy. Uh, again, are just these landmark films, and uh, I happen to have his box sets, and you know, I'm, I'm, ah. my, my kids watch them, and they're you just know, it's, it's amazing. An interesting things talking about our initial thing of where, you know, how we all have friends we're funny with and things like that, uh, and one of the differences between that is working hat, <laughs> yeah. being a crafts person, and that's what Lewis was. I mean, you go to his movies and you think that's a lot of silly, goofy fun. The man worked like a dog to achieve those things. There's a great uh, sequence in, uh, I think, no, nah, it's not Nutty Professor. I can't remember which movie where he's going for a singing lesson. And he's in this room where there's a bunch of breakable objects. Is that the Patsy? Yeah, it might be the, yeah, I think it is the Patsy. Yeah, and so he's in this room and there's this, 
expensive. They, it, the, the gag is that he keeps picking these things up and then almost dropping them. Yes. And the fun is in the way he <laughs> catches them before they fall. He catches them at the last possible <laughs> moment when, he's, when he, he reaches one way and grabs it a different way. Well, I read that, for, that, this, that one of those bits, just where he's catching a vase, he did it 130 times. Wow. <laughs> wow. Dedication. And, yeah. and a true artist. A true yeah. artist. Well, David, uh, again, con- much success with the book. It's, it's, it's a great book. Um, with all of the, you know, there's so much quote unquote negativity that people write about. It's, it's refreshing to have a book about comedy, which we can all relate to. Um, and I'm assuming, is it available at Amazon, websites, that kind of it thing? It is. It's available in the stores. All everywhere, and I'm also driving up and down the street hawking it. So, you know. <laughs> Out of your trunk, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, David, again, uh, David Mish, thank you so much for chatting with us this morning. The book is funny. The book, everything you always wanted to know about comedy. Uh, it's a great book, and uh, if you're a fan of all types of comedy, it's all in there. Um, and you did a great job of um, encompassing just how broad comedy can be, and uh, there's something for everybody in your book. Thank you. This is Viewpoint on More Public Radio. I'm your host, Edric Osborne, and we'll be right back right after this.